guys what is going on i am like so excited i look like really scary and i do apologize i've been look looking like really scary in my past couple videos but guys i'm so excited because it's the first video of the bible study so i am like so excited like seriously i think i've said that like six million times already but um, I just wanted to start this video off by starting to break down Genesis for you guys. I'm not sure everything is going to be filmed right now um, because this camera storage, my other SD card right now is being used to import, if you can even see my MacBook over there, uh, it's posting a video I made yesterday with Kylie. Uh, today's Halloween. Happy Halloween, everyone. Today, I wanted to film this video. I had it written on my schedule. Uh, which is right over here in this vicinity. I got this Aaron Condren planner like forever ago and I absolutely still love it. To kind of get this started um, about Genesis. So the first thing that I figured in all my Bible study videos that I'm gonna do for you guys is break down Genesis, each book of the Bible uh, by their important sections and then just tell you a little bit about them. So I started to try, I tried to film this the other day and I ran up, ran out of all the minutes on my camera because I just wanted to explain everything I could. But then I was like, Allie, your goal is to kind of tell them what the book is about, what sections are in it, have them read it, and then there's gonna be a section where we're gonna dive into some questions. You can answer those on your own time. I'm gonna answer them on my own time too. We're gonna do this together, and you can totally comment below like what your answers were to the questions. Maybe we can feed off of each other. I don't know how many people are going to uh, be watching these videos, but I hope that I do influence some people Um, recently it just really hit me like Jesus Like how could you not? Want a relationship with Jesus Okay, guys, so you're gonna hear my dog barking downstairs because I think our groceries just got here So that's kind of fun. But anyway, if you can hear me yesterday, I said <laughs> Hopefully my mom answers that Okay. Oh my gosh. Anyway, he's not gonna stop. So I'm just gonna talk but um, yesterday, guys, we talked a little bit about the beginning um, of the Bible, which is Genesis. And I'm just going to break those down. I'm not going to say every single detail because Genesis is a huge book, um, 53 pages in my Bible, uh, just depending on like what kind of Bible you have. It depends on the pages, but it's all the same length, um, basically. And so um, mine was 53 pages. And if I go and read 53 pages and try to break down every single thing, because literally each line in the Bible has significant meaning to it. Like you could break down each line in the Bible, maybe not the genealogies, because you're just like, you know, they're just pretty self-explanatory. But um, I'm just gonna get started. So uh, if you wanna go ahead and open your Bible with me, totally up to you. If not, get out your notes, whatever you're feeling. My mom just yelled at me to come bring, put the groceries away. <sighs> Guys, I swear, I swear, being a, being a daughter, <laughs> just kidding, I'll be, I'll be back. In the very beginning of Genesis, as I talked about um, in the last little section I put, the very first thing that we see is creation. And I hope even Christians or even non-Christians would know, or even Christians who don't pay attention, really, um, that the very first thing is creation. But what we may not know is exactly what happened during creation. So God didn't just come in one day and say, I want everything. He was very specific and broke down on the days he wanted what he created. So the very first day he made light. And the very verse for that is, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. Day two, the sky was created. So when you look up into the sky that night with your with your boyfriend or girlfriend and you're like, ooh, look at all those stars, which God created the stars too. We'll talk about that in a minute. God created that. So cool. The sun that pops out in the sky, the, just the blue of the sky, God made it. So the um, verse is, let there be an expanse. And that kind of goes on for a little bit. That's Genesis chapter one, verse six. Day three, he made dry land, seas. I have my window open in case you hear something. Love listening to the wind. Anyway, dry land, seas, plants, and trees. And God said, let the water under the heaven be gathered together into one place. Let the dry land appear. Genesis chapter one, verse nine. And guess what? Right after God said these things, this happened, but he took each day to do something, which is why we have seven days, and that's why where we get a week from. Seven days at a time, we measure it as a week because God created all of this in a week. 
and we could never do as much as God did. <laughs> Day four, he created the sun, moon, and the stars. So like I said, I'm looking up the sky like, Ooh, Milky Way, Big, Big Dipper. God created this on day four, so it's been there since the fourth day of time. Isn't that crazy? Like, just look up at the stars next time and just, like, one, those are one of the oldest things stood in this earth. I mean, so is the sky and so is light and dry land, but, like, I, I don't know. I just have, like, a weird attachment to, like, stars and everything. I think that's so cool. So, the verse for this is Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 through 15, and I didn't write it down. I actually put, it's long, lol. So go check that out. Day five, he made creatures in the sea and creatures that fly. And the verse is, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. And I think that's so interesting um, because God doesn't call it a sky. He calls it an expanse, the expanse of the heavens. What if we called it an expanse of the heavens? Instead of like, oh, what color is the sky? What if we called it like, what's the color of the expanse of the heavens? That's so beautiful. <laughs> Day six, he created animals that live on land and us, humans. He made us on day six. Uh, the verse is, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have domain over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now you might be like, what do you mean, let us? Let us make man in our image after our likeness. God is three. He is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is why when we, you know, like uh, the Catholic prayer, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Holy Spirit, you know, goes the whole cross, the whole spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The cross, you get the vibe. God is three, let us, the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son. In day seven, he rested. Now. He did not need to rest on the seventh day. He could have went as much as he wanted, but in proof, let me just prove that point really quick. In Psalm 147, five and Isaiah 40, 28, it says that God never needed to rest. He never tires. Um, and this is kind of, you can interpret it in your own way, but I think God rested because he was pleased with his work and he did not he did not need anything else. Now we get into one of the most destructive things ever, which is sin. We're gonna talk about the fall. So uh, as much as we don't like sin, um, if you like sin, uh, hopefully you're okay. I'll pray for you. Sin is just temptation. Sin is what Satan tempts us to do and we give into it a lot. Um, and that's because we're human and it happens. And thankfully we have a forgiving God who will always forgive us every single time, which is crazy. I, I could not forgive someone every single time they did something wrong. They do something wrong every hour. I would be like, oh my gosh, I'm tired of you. But God doesn't do that. He says, oh, I love you. Like, you're my, you're my daughter, you're my son. Sin happens. Adam and Eve, you probably have heard the story or at least know the names. So Adam and Eve, come into the picture. God creates Adam and then God's like, hmm, it's not good for a man to be alone. So he creates Eve out of Adam's rib when he's asleep and they are the only two humans in the world. So God gives them this beautiful garden called, called the Garden of Eden and says, you can eat from any tree that you want in this garden. Just please don't eat from this tree. Any, any tree, just not this one. That's the only one I'm just saying no, but enjoy yourselves. Kind of like that. And uh, Adam and Eve were like, ooh, okay. And uh, they were naked at the time, but they were not ashamed because they were not sinful. They don't know good and good and evil. They just know good. So then the serpent comes in. He's like, hey, did God say you can't eat from that tree? And Eve's like, yeah, he said we can eat from any tree, but he said not to eat from this one uh, or we will die. And uh, the serpent goes, you won't die. Come, just eat some fruit. Like, look how good that looks. Like, just go for it. God, God, you're not going to die. God didn't mean that. And so they're like, oh, oh, okay, I guess we won't die. So they eat from the fruit. Things go south. <laughs> they realize they're naked and they're like, oh, oh no. So they go cover themselves up and they are ashamed all of a sudden. And God's like, what did you guys do? And God probably did not have to ask that, but he asked. And Adam's like, Eve, Eve, ma Eve made me do it. <laughs> He's just so quick to blame Eve. And then Eve's like, oh, no, the serpent deceived me. He said to eat, he said we could eat from the, the tree. And God was like, oh man, well, 
this happened. So this is what I'm going to do. So God is so loving. He sewed them clothes and gave it to them and let them wear it. Even though they just deceived God, even though they just did something that God said, don't do this. And they did it anyway. Two curses towards women. This is not just apply to Eve. It applies to us women because of Eve. So thanks Eve. No, I'm just kidding. Painful labor and men were to rule over women in a relationship. However, this does not, this can be taken very out of context. What it means is that the, what, how I like to analyze it is whenever you get married, you take the man's last name. That's just how I internalize it. If you guys have different opinions, definitely let me know, but I know we're all created equal in God's eyes and men do not power us, control us, if that makes sense. What I thought was cool, and this is written in the Bible study, it says, in order to cover the shame of Adam and Eve, blood was shed on their behalf and God clothed, clothed them with animal skin. And this is like such a huge foreshadow to the New Testament when Jesus dies for us. And I just thought that was really cool. We move on to the next big sin. Uh, which is Cain and Abel. Cain gets really jealous of Abel and kills him. <laughs> and it's his brother. Someone killed my sister. Let's just say I had another sibling and they killed my sister. I'd not be like, oh, I forgive you. I love you. You're my, you're my sibling. I'd be scared. I'd be running out the door. I'd be like, oh my gosh, I'm next. Moral of the story, sin was getting bad. Cain killed Abel because he was jealous and his pride got the best of him. And then next we see God come in and say, Humanity was not supposed to be this way. And he knew it was gonna happen, he's God. He took Noah, who I'm sure you also heard of. A lot of stories in Genesis are super famous. Um, especially for me, like I knew all these stories before I really went in and read it and I'm pretty new in my faith. So God flooded, well said he was gonna flood the earth. So he told Noah, he had favor on Noah. Noah, we gotta get you in an ark. You're gonna build this ark. It's gonna be this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and give him all the measurements. It said, get all your family, bring it onto the ark, get two of each kind of animal, a male and a woman, a male and a woman, a male and a female. I was like, why did that sound weird? So two of each kind of animal, bring them on with you and get in and get ready because I'm about to flood the earth. Noah did what God said. No, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this. He built the ark, he got his family on it, the flood came, he sent a dove out, and the dove came back because it didn't have anywhere to put his feet. He sent the dove out, and it came back with an olive leaf, and then he sent the dove out a third time, and the dove never came back. So now I was like, ooh, the earth is okay to go onto now. They go out, and guess what? It was beautiful again, and it was just Noah and his family. And then this whole thing happens with Noah um, and his son ham and there's a curse of ham um which is honestly a pretty like messed up i'm sure there's many people out there who have really really good guesses or maybe even could understand what happened i still don't really understand what happened with ham and so if you when you read that or if you already read it that's one of the things i kind of want to know what you think happened there i'm assuming something not good happened since noah was drunk passed out and naked um and his son came in told his brothers and his brothers were kind and covered him up but we don't know what ham did so and then God brings in Abraham. And I love these stories of each of these men. We go Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Abraham really hits, really hits because you, you just know that name. You know, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. You know, <laughs> you know that song? <laughs> maybe you do, maybe you don't, but um, that's the song, <laughs> part of it at least. We are all descendants of Abraham. God promised Abraham, and this is after the flood. Abraham comes into the picture. God says, I'm gonna restore the Garden of Eden through this family. And so, God starts with Abraham. And Abraham, he says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. You're gonna have so, so many offspring, so much offspring, I don't really know correct grammar. You will have as much offspring as you do, the dust of the earth, the stars in the sky, if you're able to count them, which God is implying, like you can't count that. As much sand on the shore, like you will not be able to count that. That's how much offspring you'll have. And Abraham's like, wow, okay God, I'll do whatever you say, like all in. Some time passes and Abraham and his wife Sarah are getting kind of tired. So Abraham says, you know what? And so, so they both come to an agreement. Abraham and Sarah is like, let's just sleep with our servant. I'm gonna sleep with their servant, Hagar. Hopefully we'll have, like, have a child through her. And they do. Um, 
she conceives and Hagar flees. She's like, oh my gosh, what did I do? What did I just, this is not right. Uh, flees and an angel of the Lord appears to Hagar and says, oh, oh my gosh, guys, I'm so sorry. We gotta remember the Tower of Babel. So the Tower of Babel, 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 something like that, God confuses the languages and that's why there's like a separation, like uh, diversity and everything kind of mixed up and jumbled. And then Abraham comes in. So I forgot to mention that, but yes, there it is in case you're wondering. Ah, here it is. So the angel of the Lord and says, behold, you're pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. And that's just that one part. But the angel of the Lord also says, Hagar, servant of Sarah, Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from a mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. I will surely multiply your offspring so they cannot be numbered for multitude. And then Hagar said, you are God of seeing. For she said, truly, I have seen him who looks after me. So. I think that's so beautiful, like you are a god of seeing. That was a beautiful moment with Hagar and the angel of the Lord. And I just love that you are a god of seeing. That's so true, God sees us in everything that we do. God has never taken our eyes, his eyes off of us. And I think sometimes we're like, God doesn't even know I exist. Like God's like, God cares more about this person than, they, than, than he does me. And that's not true. God always has his hand on us. God is always guiding us. God's always walking next to us, beside us, in front of us, and behind us. He's like all four sides. <laughs> so I thought that was a beautiful verse. So that happens with um, Abraham and Hagar. And God didn't really like it, but he allowed it. Um, but obviously God wasn't like, you know, like do this, do this. God wanted it to happen naturally. God wanted it to happen with Sarah and Abraham. You know, they are buried. So, so we fast forward a little bit and Abraham and Sarah do have a child and they name him Isaac. Now, after Isaac's born, something happens. It's a test of faith and God actually calls Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. His one son he waited so long for, he was 100 years old at this time, God says, come bring him to me and sacrifice him to me. Here's what, here's exactly what, um, exactly what they said. Abraham, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. And he said, do not lay hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took off, took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. The Lord will provide. The Lord will always, always come through. The Lord will always provide. Abraham's about to die and Abraham said to his servant, go find someone for my son. The servant started speaking to God and said, oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the water, the spring of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your jar, jar that I may drink. And who shall say, drink and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. Before he had even finished speaking, a woman came out and her name was Rebecca. And this exact, this exact thing that he had said, he prayed, happened. May I have a drink of your water? Sure, I will also water for your, for your I'll also water your camels. And that exactly happened. Rebecca said she will go. So now Isaac has a wife. Um, so after that, Abraham actually dies. But um, now, Isaac and Rebecca. Yay! And then Rebecca has twins. She has Jacob and Esau. So here's what's very interesting about this. So Jacob and Esau, I could go through every single story in here, uh, but it would take me forever, like I said. So. Esau actually sells his birthright to Jacob because he wanted stew or something like that because he was so hungry. Jacob was a little manipulative there, wasn't he? He, he? he made him sell his birthright so he could eat. What happens here is Isaac is about to die and Isaac was going to bless his oldest son, which is Esau. Now, because that's how it worked. Now, Isaac was very old, he was blind, he really couldn't see, but Rebecca, 
really favored Jacob, really favored Jacob. So she told, she told him, go do this for your, for your father. Go prepare him this and then he'll give you his blessing. Now, Jacob did just that while Esau was going up to do that. But Jacob got there first. Jacob said, here you go, father, here I am. Um, and then God said, I mean, <laughs> Isaac said, are you my son? Like, are you like, who, who, are, who are you? And then, and then Jacob pretended to be Esau. So Jacob pretended to be Esau and got the blessing. Now, very, is very, this is very, this is very, very sneaky of, of Jacob. Um, basically what happens is Esau then comes in later and is like, what? Like, I'm Esau, you, like, you just, and then they know. Isaac knows he just gave it to Jacob. So Esau's like, do you have something for me? Is there anything for me? So then basically what happens is Isaac did the best he could with the rest of the blessing he could give for Esau. Esau was so furious with them. He was like, I'm going to kill my brother. So then Rebecca told, told Jacob, he's like, run, run. She said, run. So Jacob ran, Jacob ran. And then Jacob marries two women. What? Actually, what he wanted to do was marry Rachel. He, she was like beautiful, and Leah was like weak eyes. I think that's how they describe her. But it says Rachel was beautiful. Her figure, her face, her eyes, everything was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel, but Laban gives Jacob Leah, and then he lie lied with lay lay with Leah. <laughs> but Jacob woke up in the morning. I was like, Leah. He's like, wait, I thought you were Rachel. I thought I was marrying Rachel. I thought I was gonna be with Rachel. But then Laban had this whole thing and was like, nope, you gotta go with Leah first and then you can have Rachel. Seven more years or something like that. So Jacob did just that. She's like, oh, okay. And so they conceived a lot of sons. So Leah had many sons, Rachel had a couple sons. We get all the way from Jacob to Joseph. So, Joseph was the child of Rachel um, and Jacob. And Joseph is gonna have a really life-changing story. They had many sons, 12, and then a daughter. And Dinah, the daughter of Dinah, all of the sons, they had a lot of kids, but they fleed from Laban. And then there's Joseph, uh, which actually really quickly before I talk about Joseph, there is a part in the story where Jacob and Esau meet up again. And Esau, obviously he was probably furious with Jacob for stealing the blessing, but when they met up, Esau ran up and gave him a hug and they both tried to offer each other things and it was it was beautiful. Um, but Jacob was very afraid because he had heard a message that he was sending him and 400 men his way. And doesn't that make you think like, oh, there's about to be like a fight or something? Nope, just one big hug. Also, Jacob in this journey meets God and he actually gets the name Israel. So if you hear like, Someone say, mention Israel in Genesis, that is Jacob. Just in case you're wondering, if, or if you go and read and you accidentally skip over that part and you're like, who's Israel? That's Jacob. So now what I really wanted to get into is Joseph. And this is the very last part of our Genesis breakdown. Joseph steps in and he is born. He's the 12th son of all the sons of Jacob. Rachel and Leah and Bilhah and Zilpha. I don't remember how to say. I'll say each of their names. Yeah, Zilpha, Leah, Rachel, and Bilha. Those are all the kids that that Jacob or Jacob Jacob was with all the all the ones that he conceived through. Here is where things get crazy. You clearly see that Israel loved Joseph more than any of the boys, and you'll see why. God had such a big purpose for Joseph. So Joseph comes to his brothers, all of his brothers, and says, Hey guys, I just had a dream. I just had this awesome, awesome dream. We were binding sheaves in the field and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him for his dreams. And all of his brothers already hated him. So for Joseph to come up to them and tell them about his dream where he's gonna rule over his older brothers, they're like, all right, kid, chill, like, come on. And then he also has this beautiful colored robe, but all of his brothers have this like raggedy robe and they're like, 
what is going on? Like, this is unfair. Like, our brother gets these great things. Why don't we get anything like that? They get a, He gets such a cool colored robe. We get this raggedy robe. He has these dreams of ruling over us. And he actually has a second dream. And he, after his brothers were even bad, Joseph had the nerve to, <laughs> the nerve to go up and tell them the audacity. He went up and told them again about another dream. His brothers were like, okay, we need to come up with a plan. He He's gone, like, let's get rid of this guy. They said, this is exactly what they said. Here comes this dreamer, come now and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him and we will see what becomes of his dreams. And they're like, yeah. But then when Reuben heard it, he rescued him and said, let us not take his life. Instead, Judah says, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our own flesh. So instead, how sweet, they decide to sell him into slavery. Huh. Wow, <laughs> so kind. So then, they go and sell Joseph into slavery, and they bring back his coat, covered in blood. Which is not his blood, but covered in blood, and said, I think our brother has died, Jacob. And of course, Jacob's like, oh my gosh, my son you know like so so sad you know it's his favorite son and he just died and he didn't get to say goodbye it was a lot a lot going on there so joseph goes down and he's this amazing guy he's also very good looking so the potiphar's wife actually comes up to him and says lie with me and J joseph's like no like no no and she keeps insisting so J Joseph tries to run. Potiphar's wife got a hold of, uh, of something of his and I can't remember exactly what it was. Oh, his garment. Potiphar's wife had a garment in his hand so she was like, I gotta come up with a story. I was like, look at it. Like he tried to, he tried to lie with me and I, could, I said no and like they found Joseph and they threw him into prison. And Joseph was becoming very successful. Basically, there's this big tie with Joseph in dreams. So while he's in prison, these men have these dreams and there's no one to interpret them from. So Joseph is like, okay, I will. Uh, the Lord's with me, I'll interpret your dreams. And um, so Joseph told the chief cupbearer, who was one of the people that Joseph, you know, said their dream and um, was like, please remember me when you go to see the pharaoh please tell him that about your dream uh that i figured it out the cupbearer did not remember joseph but a little bit later on he's like oh yeah i remember i remember who interpreted my dream it was joseph it was it was this guy and so the pharaoh actually has one and was like oh well let me go talk to him he interprets the dream and sure enough pharaoh's dream comes true too joseph is telling the truth and so he rises to power after all of that, they figure out that the Potiphar's wife was lying and Joseph was telling the truth. Take him out of prison and he rises to power. Pharaoh says, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. So Joseph rose to power. Now this crazy thing happens where his brothers go down to Egypt to get food and Joseph's in Egypt. And so Joseph sees all of his brothers and he recognizes them, but they don't recognize him because they probably thought he was going to be dead by now or they thought he was going to, you know, be this poor guy. But Joseph is this mighty figure and they say, hi, we're coming to get some food. And Joseph, this whole process kind of goes with them like, oh, why is your youngest brother not here? Like, go back and get your youngest brother because his youngest brother, him and are the only two that came from Rachel, Joseph and then the other brother, Benjamin. He's just like, oh, go get the youngest brother. And then they're like, oh, they said our youngest brother can't come. Like, blah, blah, blah. This whole thing happens. One of them stays in prison while the rest of them go get there so that they have to come back for something. They come back. They go to have a feast with Joseph. And Joseph says, it's me. It's me, your brother. Like, is my father well? And they're all like, oh my gosh, we sold this boy into slavery. Like, oh no. He's going to hate us. He's going to kill us. He's going to do something to us. But instead... Joseph says, you have intended this for evil, but God intended this for good. Joseph shows them mercy and grace, and that's exactly what God does for us each and every day. So the Lord was really with Joseph this whole entire time while he was in prison, whenever he was rising to power, he did not forget God. And sometimes when people get successful and fame and fortune, they often forget God. And God's like, hey, because we forget to give God credit. And Joseph remembered God the whole time. God was always with him. This beautiful story came out of it. When Jacob saw Joseph 
for like the first time after thinking he was dead. It was like the most beautiful thing ever. After that, Jacob dies and so does uh, Joseph. And then it goes into the book of Exodus, which we are gonna do next. And this is a pretty big book, um, as well. I think because um, I realized how much I talked in Genesis I'm gonna try to talk a little bit less in Exodus and I, hopefully I tried I like try to make sense of things um, But I just wanted to give you guys a breakdown But sometimes I just tend to keep talking and sometimes things don't really make sense The whole thing was about the creation the fall the flood Abraham Isaac Jacob Joseph and that was the whole book of Genesis, all those things. Next, Moses is going to come in. But I want you guys to really think about this whole book and what you think the key message was to it. For me, I just kind of got like, God will provide and God is always with us. Even when we feel like we're at our lowest of lows, God will always be there. I hope you guys will read it if you haven't yet because it's such a cool book. It's the very first book of the Bible. Everything's just kind of thrown at you, which is why I feel like this is so heavy and long. Um, but you know, gotta, gotta talk about all of it. We can't just talk about the good parts. I want you guys to go in depth and really read this for yourself. I'm not gonna ask too many questions on Genesis, really. I don't think I'm gonna ask any except for what was your key takeaway. Since this is such a big book and it's our first session, I really just want you guys to get a jump start on this. I hope this breakdown was helpful. There are two uh, links that I'm gonna put in the link below that if you're like, oh my gosh, I can't watch this girl talk for an hour. <laughs> go watch these two like six, seven minute videos um i don't know how long each one is really but like around that time go watch those they break down genesis like so definitely go watch that um i'm gonna link it below if it's just easier for you more convenient for you to do that but um i hope you guys enjoyed and uh i'm gonna go ahead and get started on exodus this week and then at the end of the week we'll talk about exodus so i'll see you guys then or sooner <laughs> hope you guys enjoyed my little talk about genesis and i just can't wait for the next part so Peace out from Ellie Girl. Bye.